Today's message has been brought to you by Faith Family Church in Billings, Montana. For more information, visit faithfamilybillings.com. Well, it is really nice out, isn't it? Oh my goodness. This weather, I was telling everybody last week, well, maybe it was the week before, but I was getting ready for, uh, I actually found myself wanting to mow the lawn. (laughs) <laughs> that's when I knew I was done with winter. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you want to, if you don't have a Bible, we, there are some in the pews in front of you. There's an NIV Bible there. One's a hymnal. So I, don't open the hymnal because I, you'll be lost if you try and follow me in the hymnal. Um, we don't use those hymnals very often. They're actually just part of what's here, but we have talked about maybe breaking out a hymn here, here or there. Okay. If you're from a traditional church background, you're going to find out that we're not real traditional. You know, but that's okay. What I've found out through the years is that God can move in all sorts of groups. It doesn't really matter if you came from Catholic or Baptist or, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of different denominations, but the Lord loves all his people. And so our main goal here is to not fall in, fall in love with way services are done or traditions of men, but really fall in love with the Lord, with his word, and then with people. You know what I mean? I mean, God is all about people. I heard a testimony one time about a minister who was sitting in, uh, he was actually sitting in downtown New York and he felt like the Lord said to him, look around, what do you see? He said, what do you see? And, uh, and the man looked, started looking around and he said, uh, he said, well, I see buildings. I see, you know, airplanes were going over. He said, I see plants and trees and, and, and cars going by. And of course, New York's pretty busy, obviously. And the Lord said to me, he said, what do you, what do you think I see? He said, Lord, I don't know. He said, I see people. I see people. See, God doesn't look down and go and, and just look at his creation. He looks at his, the prize of his creation, which is humanity. Humanity is the number one thing on God's mind. Did you know that? The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's not just the world as, you know, the ball floating in the middle of space, okay? It's not just that, because we know we're not the biggest thing in the planet, or I mean in the universe. You know that? Have you you've seen, I know you have. You've seen the scientific things that they have available now where they've looked out into space. I mean, there are suns out there that dwarf Our sun, that we could put our sun into multiple times. So the longer that science kind of moves along and discovers things, um, they're, they're beginning to realize, wait, there's a whole lot more out here than we realized. And the more that technology advances, I find personally in looking at the scripture that God's word just keeps getting confirmed over and over and over again. Now you could willfully lie about it and be deceived, but I've found that the Bible is confirmed over and over and over again. So the most important thing to God is not church buildings, although we're thankful for this one, because if it was raining right now, it'd be tough for you to read out of your Bible because it'd be soggy soon. Um, it's not seats or pews or any of that, but it's the people that are in the pews and so um, and the people that are coming in the doors and that's what he's after. And so I just want to relay that to you because of just you understanding God's love in that. And I'll try not to move too much here so I don't blow all over this microphone. All right, John chapter 15. We are in the middle of a series um, that we're calling Abide. And I could explain to you why it's called that, but let me just say this. It's about understanding your relationship with God, okay? Some people say, well, I don't even know what it is. Well, stick around a little bit. You'll figure out a little bit more here. In order for us to understand our relationship with God, we never go to the world to find out what our relationship with God is like or what it's supposed to be. We don't go to science to figure it out. We don't go to religion just as religion as a whole. We go to the Bible to find out what our relationship with God is like. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. And so um, the way that we know God as our Father is through Jesus Christ. And so in understanding our relationship with God, we need to understand from his word what he said to us. And so that's what we're doing. Now, we've gone through two other series prior to this one at the start of the uh, at the start of the church. And if you want to go back and listen to them, you can. They're available on the website. You can download them for free. You don't need, there's no charge for them. And I heard one guy say, no charge means no excuse. Okay, it means you can get to it. So if you want to download those messages and put them on your iPod, I mean, we live in a very uh, technologically advanced 
uh, society. I actually was looking at our statistics the other day on some of the uh, listens and different things on the sound, on the uh, on SoundCloud, which is a, a, a server we use, and on Facebook. And you know where most people check the church out from in those things from their mobile phone. Their mobile phone. I mean, we use our mobile phones. It's like mobile world. You know, everything is available. You don't even have to sit in your living room to watch TV. Do you remember old telephones? Do you remember stringing the cord all the way through the house (laughs) trying to find some quiet place to talk? You can talk anywhere now. You can watch a video anywhere. So it's all available online, which I'm really thankful for. And so you can go to the website. And again, that's on the uh, bulletin if you want to go there and, and catch up on those. And what we're talking about right now is our relationship with God. And our main text is John chapter 15. And it, it starts in verse number, let me get there, verse number one. It says, Jesus said this. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, the actual translation there is he lifts it up. Okay? It looks like he says, I take it and throw it away. But that's not what it says there. It actually says he lifts it up because you'll see why here in the next verse. The next verse says this in verse 2. Or I'm sorry, in, in uh, well, set halfway through verse 2. He says he takes it away. And then he says, in every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So he's talking about not killing the plant. He's talking about causing the plant to produce more fruit. Okay, he's working on increasing the fruit of that plant. He has your good in mind. Verse three says that says this. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Verse four says abide. There's where we got the title for the message. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Look at verse five. I am the vine and you are the branches. So we understand now who's the vine. Jesus is the vine. Who's the branch? That be you. That be me. You see that? So He's the vine. So think of it like this. You look at the trees that are out here. Does the branch support the trunk or does the trunk support the branch? The trunk supports the branch. Do you see what God's saying right here? He's saying, look, you're not supporting me. I'm supporting you. I'm the source of life that you need. So sometimes, okay, think of it in terms like this. Sometimes it feels like you're going through life and and you're struggling. Things aren't going real well. The reason may be is that you're not in the trunk. (laughs) Anybody familiar with what grafting is? Okay, Uh, like grafting a tree branch into another tree. What they do is they cut a hole in the trunk. They, They slice a hole in there. And they open it up, and then they open the branch on another tree that they take, they've taken from another tree, and they put it in there. And then they kind of wrap it up. And what ends up happening is, is that trunk of that tree and the life source that's in it begins to assimilate into that branch and give it life. And that's what causes that branch then not to die, but to produce fruit or produce Life. So the same principle is being shown to you right here. Jesus is very simply saying, look, the life that you're looking for is in me. I'm the one that has the roots into the soil of God to be able to give you life. Does that make sense? So he's we're drawing that life out of God. And so he's, that's what he's talking about here. So verse five again, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me, he who abides in me, um, and I in him bears much fruit for without me, you can do what? Nothing. Do you see that second part of that verse right there? Let's look at it again. Let's look at it again. Verse 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. That's a good promise. For without me, you can do how much? You ever feel like you're doing nothing? It could be because you're not including the Lord in it. It could be that very simple reason right there. Now, verse 6. 
If anyone does not abide in me, he casts out as a branch and is withered, and they gather and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So this is where this idea of abide came from, okay? Very simply this. If we want to have a fruitful life, if we want to have a life that is producing something, have you ever have you ever got at the end of your day and thought, do I have any peace in my life at all? <laughs> you know, like for me and Heidi, obviously we have little kids. And so some days it feels like you get up real early. You, you uh, like for me, I get up, do my devotion time. Then I go work construction all day. You know, construction is not like sitting at a desk. <laughs> it is work. We are carrying, you know, five gallon buckets of paint we're carrying sprayers we're running mud and we're doing all sorts of stuff like that and it's taxing it's it's physical work which i like i like physical work so that's not a big deal to me but by the end of the day it feels like you spent everything that was in you and you just want to sit down have you ever had that feeling now the other side of it is i have worked jobs where it was sit down all day and listen to people That can be draining too. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, and the place that I worked was a call center. So not everybody that called in was in a real good mood. You know what I mean? They were calling him for whatever reason they were. A lot of times they were upset. But if you have to listen to that all day, that's mentally tiring. And so at the end of the day, you feel like, man, is there any life in me left? And that's where the Lord is saying to us, look, I can give you strength that you need. I can give you the life that you're looking for. The peace that you're looking for, it's not found in anything in this world. Now, things can be enjoyed in this world. I know people, I've shared the Lord with people before, and they've told me, well, you know, nature is where I connect with God. Well, connect with God on a Friday afternoon in nature and be at church on Sunday. (laughs) You know what I mean? I've never quite understood that. They act like only God's in nature on church day. Really what they're telling me is they don't want to come, which they should have just told me that. That would have been better because I wasn't going to fall for the other one anyway. Or I've had people tell me, I've invited them to church. They said, man, if I stepped inside a church, God would kill me. I'm thinking, dude, God could kill you wherever you're at. He doesn't need you in the physical building. You know what I mean? He can get you wherever you are. The reason why you ain't dead is because he doesn't want to get you. He wants to save you. He loves you. He's not looking for ways to make your life harder. He said, look, my, my word is a light to your path. Have you ever tried to do something in the dark? It's hard. Have you ever tried to put something together and you just didn't have the right kind of source of light there? It's so difficult. You're looking for a flashlight or something to give you more light. Well, a lot of people are doing life without the right light source. They just don't have the right light source. What I found in my life, and I've been serving the Lord now since I was 19, and I'm 38, so you can figure it out. All right? What I've found in my life is the more I walk by this light, the easier my life gets. And there are things in here that when I look at it and read it, and I go, Lord, that just doesn't make sense to me. And he says to me, the Bible doesn't make sense, Sean. It makes faith. (laughs) It requires faith. What is faith? Faith is in believing in something that you don't see. You don't see it. That doesn't mean you won't see it. It's just that God, in his wisdom and knowledge, has, has decided to hide himself to a degree. He's given you enough evidence about himself to where you can make a decision to believe or not believe. There's enough evidence to believe. There's no question about that. Now, I know there's a lot of things that are in the world today that say there is no God and all that stuff. But really, the evidence is so shallow and so weak. I mean, if you look at it and you're honest, it just doesn't it doesn't amount to much. Honestly, it takes more faith to believe in some of that than it does to not believe in God. Okay, and so what I'm saying in all this is very simply this in our relationship with God in our life. If we don't feel like we're getting the results that we should, the answer is very simple. We just need to go back to what always works. We need to abide in him. We need to abide in him. Now, don't turn that into a religious thing. Or I should say, don't turn it into a tradition thing. Simply abiding in the Lord is reading your chapter, your scripture, every day. And then... Pulling out a scripture that you, that really, you felt like, hey, that really stood out to me. 
and then practicing that one. We make it so difficult sometimes. Some people think, well, if I'm going to really serve God, I got to, you know, not get married and, you know, become a monk. <laughs> Listen, I'm married and I ain't no monk. <laughs> okay? And I know the Lord. Now, I don't know Him all there is. You know, it'll take eternity for that. So that's why I'm thankful that I'm going there. But what I'm saying is, is that very simply, you can know God. Just start by talking to him and reading his word. You know, if I look back over my life, when I first gave my heart to the Lord, I was 19. Where I am today is so much better than where I was then. I mean, I, you can, I, and I was raised in a Christian home. But I didn't really know the Lord. But once you get to know him and you're actually following after him and you just do it year after year, man, it just keeps getting better and better. Or as I heard one guy say, gooder and gooder. Okay? So we're talking about abiding in the Lord. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. book of Romans is right after the book of Acts. So if you were in John 15, if you just go to the right a couple of books, you'll get there. Romans chapter 10, verse number 9. They say, how do I get in God? This is the verse right here. It says this. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart. Now that's your inside. One believes unto righteousness. Now don't let that word throw you. That word just means that you're okay with God. It means you're right with God. Okay. And with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. Now. If you have kids. You know that sometimes they'll try and hide stuff from you, and you got to get them to confess. <laughs> okay? They'll, have you ever, my, now my kids have done this. My son has done this. Well, all, I think all my kids have. Um, but they've done something that they weren't supposed to, and then they don't want to tell you because they knew they weren't supposed to do it, because they know they might get in trouble. But the one thing that you want them to do is confess and tell you the truth. Now, I'm pretty, most of the time, pretty merciful about it. If I feel like my child knew what they were supposed to do and they just did it anyway, then there's a discipline. But if I feel like they didn't know what they were doing or they didn't realize this is what we wanted and they confessed to it, then I just, okay, we'll chalk it up as this is education this way and we'll move forward from here. But, but confession is very simply what? It's them saying, them speaking the truth. Okay. So if we look back at this verse in Romans 10, notice that there's a believing in the heart, but then there's a what? A confession with the mouth. You say, how do I abide in God? You believe that Jesus is his son, that Jesus came and paid the price for your and my sins on the cross, and then you believe that God raised him from the dead. Now, some people read this and they go, I don't know, raising the dead, raising... Well, it's happened since then, okay? But there is there is no evidence that Jesus is on the planet today. Now, there's all the evidence, not only uh, in this Bible that he was raised from the dead, because there were, what, 500 witnesses in the book of, of, of Acts that claimed that they saw Jesus raised from the dead. Imagine if if I stole something. And I was in court. And I'm trying to get off. Okay? I'm lying. No, no, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. But the other attorney brings in 500 witnesses who saw me do it. Would that be enough evidence? Do you think I would get off? I'd have one good lawyer or liar or lawyer or something if I did get off. You know what I mean? I'd have one good lawyer. But 500 witnesses? came against and said, no, no, he stole it. I watched him. He was wearing this. That's the guy right there. Well, see, that's what the Bible is. Now, not only is the Bible accurate in its the way it's written, but if you study it from a historical perspective, 
If you study it from a language perspective, I'm talking about history going back, linguistics, and from an architectural perspective. In other words, from a, no, archaeological perspective. There we go. I'll get the right word eventually. An archaeological perspective, if you go back and look at it, do you know how many times that this book is proven true? Do you know they will take, I've studied some of these things because I'm a Bible nerd, but um, I've, they, they've gone back and they've looked up battles that were in the Old Testament. You know, where it was like 10,000 troops versus 10,000 troops. And they'll go through history and figure out the very location that that battle was. And they'll go do an archaeological dig there and they'll find horse bones. They'll find shields and swords and all sorts of stuff that was in that battle in the ground. Isn't that interesting? It's all in there. It's all truth. He is giving us evidence. Look, I did raise from the dead. I am the son of God. This is who I am. And so that being said... Uh, in abiding in the Lord, it's very simply, people try to make it difficult, but it's as simple as, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. And I confess that. It is that simple. And what takes place is then the Holy Spirit changes your heart. He changes your heart. Now, let's go take a look at something because we're moving to a particular point. And if, if some of that's still a little bit um, blind to you, I encourage you to go back and listen to the other messages because we've really been building up until this point. And last week we talked about the importance of what you say. And we brought in here at Romans 10, 9, and 10 where it started. Now let's go to the Old, Old Testament in Proverbs chapter 6. So if you want to turn back to the Old Testament, and if you start at Romans and go to the left, or if you want to look up in the concordance, There's one giant book before Proverbs, and it's called Psalms. Another good thing about reading a chapter in your Bible every day is you get familiar with with where everything is, which is important. Okay, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 2 says this. You are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. Now, in the Amplified, it says this. You are snared with the words of your lips. You are caught by the speech of your mouth. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20. I just want to go through these scriptures, and it may seem like, why are you going through all those? Because I want you to see that this is not something that I made up, but that the Bible says it. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20, and I'm going to read verse 20 to 1 as well. But it says this, A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. Isn't that interesting? From the produce, you know you know what produce, produce is, right? If you go to the store, you go to the produce section. From the produce, the production, the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Death and life are what? In the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Listen to this in the message. It says, words satisfy the mind, or I would say the heart there instead of the mind, but as much as fruit does the stomach. Good talk is as gratifying as good harvest. Listen to verse 21. Words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit you choose. They're either poison or fruit. Who chooses? We choose. And you say, what does that got to do with abiding in the Lord? Well, what we're going to move into as we go is we're going to see that God provided for us a whole bunch of promises that are words that are given to us to speak over our life. So in other words, I'll put it to you like this. He provided, he has said certain things about you. So we'll just go back to the basics of salvation. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is something that God spoke to you. So in order for that to operate in your life, then according to Romans 10, 9, and 10, you have to take that word and then do what? Jesus is the Son of God, and I confess that he's my Savior and Lord. And then it becomes yours. Well, this is the process that God uses in everything. If you always wondered, well, how did God create the earth? He spoke. He is big on words to the point that he put in the Bible, words kill, words give life. They either poison or they either, yeah, they, they're either poison or fruit. You choose. So what we're learning is to choose 
to say what God says about us. Okay? So, I could go into more about that, but let's just go over to Matthew chapter 12. So we're going back to the right. Your fingers are getting a workout. Matthew chapter 12. And verse number 34. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 34. I'm going to read it to you in the NIV, and then I'll read it in the living. But it says this. Jesus is talking to the religious leaders of his day. Jesus was um, not politically correct, (laughs) if you look at his life. But he said, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of what? The overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Do you see that? Whatever is in abundance in your heart, that's what you say. Have you ever kind of snuck up behind yourself and said, what am I saying? Why am I saying this? Probably because it's an overflow of what's in you. So what we're doing is we're working on getting an overflow of God's words in us so that we say what he says. That doesn't mean you go around with the Bible and you just constantly quote a scripture to somebody. Okay, because I don't do that. But I don't necessarily just say everything everybody else says either. Because I know from Proverbs 18.21 that if I say certain things, it could be poison to me. Have you ever been in a, a strong discussion with somebody? There's a few married people here, so I know you have. Because I'm married. <laughs> I've been married for 15 years now. And have you ever gotten a discussion and you, you're, you're going back and forth and there's a little too much emotion involved and you say something you wish you wouldn't have and by the time it's gone out of your mouth, you go, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And the discussion goes from level huh, to level, whoa, just like that. That's the power of what? Your tongue. That's the power of your tongue. Your tongue has tremendous ability in it. You just didn't realize it. You thought, yeah, I taste food with it. Yeah, but it's a whole lot more than that. (laughs) It's a whole lot more than that, okay? The Living Bible says this. You brood of snakes. See, Jesus, he was really after it today. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For a man's heart determines his speech. A good man's speech reveals the rich treasures within him. A good man's speech reveals the rich treasures that are within him. So whatever is in you in abundance will come out. If you want to develop strong faith, then you continually tell what the Lord is doing for you. You talk about it. The more you talk about it, the more real he becomes to you. The less you talk about it, the less real. All right, let's go over to um, 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter three, verse 10. We're going to see it here again. And I'm going to read this to you out of the living Bible, or I'm sorry, the new living translation. But it says this, first Peter three, 10 for the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your what tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. But isn't it interesting that he says, if you want to enjoy life and see happy days, many happy days, if you want to enjoy life, and I don't know anybody that doesn't want to enjoy life. I mean, it's pretty rare. Most people want to enjoy life. They want to have a a structured life, a life that isn't just filled with chaos all the time. And what the Lord is saying here is, look, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, good days, do what? Watch what you what? Say. Watch what you say. Yeah, watch what you say. Make sure you say what I say. I mean, you could put that in there. It would be safe. The Lord is basically saying, look. If you want to see many good days, this is the way you got to go. 
at some point in your life, I know for me, I had to make a decision. Okay, the way that I'm doing it isn't working. I'm going to do it this way. And that was 19 years ago. I like it better this way. <laughs> way better than the other way. Because the other way, it just, it, it um, I wish I could put it into words, but it's so hollow. It's just empty. There's no, uh, there's no real rest in your heart. And that's where I was. I was kind of at that tension point where you're just like back and forth, back and forth. Well, am I going to do it this way or this way? And I'll be honest, I've gone to, uh, not that every one of my, uh, uh, I haven't gone to any class reunions. I shouldn't say that. I'm saying that wrong. I didn't go to my 10-year class reunion. I figure I'm going to go to like the 30 and 40 to see who's still alive. <laughs> but. On Facebook and things like that, of course, you connect. You know what I mean? There's always a graduating class of this and that. And I got graduating classes from high school and college. So, But you look over people's lives. And some people that I know from high school, their lives haven't changed a whole lot. Other people's have totally changed. Some people that I know from high school, because I was a kind of a raucous kid, um, I partied a lot. And we got, we got in trouble <laughs> too much. But... Um, the people now I walked away from that when I gave my life to the Lord. But I, what I found was is that the people that stayed in it, boy, they look rough. You ever notice certain lifestyles can really take a toll on you? I mean, just physically they can. And so I realized that if I wanted to see good days, I had to change what I say and change what I do and make a decision to serve the Lord. And so that's what I did. And so today where I'm at, boy, wouldn't you can't trade it for nothing. There's not enough money in the world. I don't care. There's nothing, there's nothing that, is, that is better than serving the Lord in my life. And so if we want to see those good days, we've got to follow 1 Peter 3.10. Okay, one more point, and then we'll wrap it up here. I want to show you the example of faith. Let's go to Romans chapter 4, and this is where we're going to park. We're going to stop right here. And uh, if you get anything out of this message today, I would emphasize this one point right here. Um, these verses that we're about to look at right here in Romans 4. I w- I'd recommend that you look over these a couple of times. There's a gentleman by the name of Abraham, and he's called the father of our faith. Um, he's the father of the natural lineage of the Jews, but then he's also the father of the spiritual. <laughs> you could almost call him spiritual Jews because Paul said, we're not, a, we're not a Jew outwardly, but we're one inwardly, and, and Christ is in our heart. Do you know Jesus was a Jew? He was a Jewish man. Did you know that? And so, um, but anyway, um, Abraham was the, the father of the Jews. In other words, the Jewish line came from him as far as a, as far as a generation and, and, a, and a, a group of people, by blood, anyway. And so... Um, He's called the father of the Jews. But in Romans chapter 4, we see, and this is where it came about. I'm going to start in verse number 17. And I'm going to read it to you in the Amplified, so it's a little more wordy. But uh, you'll get the picture. The NIV will be okay for you. Um, God made a promise to Abraham. And my, my main emphasis in this is not... The promise is right, and it's good. But it's how Abraham obtained that promise. In other words... How Abraham made that promise his. How, um, what's another way I could say it? How Abraham got the promise of God from just being words to actually happening in his life. Does that make sense? Any of you ever had a goal? I want to save $1,000. Okay? You can have a goal. Yeah, I know I can save $1,000. But how do you do it? You have to consistently put money in savings, right? You have to put something in there. And then what you saw as the goal, which was $1,000, becomes a reality as you do it. And that's the process that we're going to show you here. God is making a promise to Abraham. And so in order for that promise to be a reality, Abraham had to follow some steps of obedience. And what you're going to see is it's exactly what we've been talking about up till this point. There was a promise made. He believed it in his heart. Then he confessed it with his mouth. And then it became a reality in his life. Okay, Romans chapter 4 verse 17 says this. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He was appointed our father. In the sight of God in whom he believed. So Abraham believed God. 
who gives life to the dead. So what does God do? He gives life to the dead. And he speaks of the non-existent things. In other words, they don't exist here. As if they already existed. Okay? Now, verse 18. For Abraham, human reason for hope being gone, hoped in faith that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been promised, so shall your descendants be. So the Lord told him, you're going to be the father of many nations. Okay, verse number um, 19. Did I just read 18? Okay. Verse number 19 says this. He did not weaken in faith when he considered the deadness of his own body or the deadness of Sarah. And he was about, what, a 100 years old? Are you kidding? That's pretty old, isn't it? Okay, so verse 19 again. Let me read it because I read it wrong. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a 100 years old. And then the last part, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20 says this. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform. Okay. All right, now, I'm going to explain this to you, so don't get confused. Okay, you don't, don't say, I don't get it. All right, work with me here, and we'll explain this to you. Sometimes you read through the Bible, and they, it's written in a, a language, not a language that we don't understand, but in a structure that sometimes we don't understand today, because we don't talk in these and thous. Sometimes I think they, they hired Yoda to translate some of the scriptures. You ever heard Yoda? He says things backwards. But anyway... Um, in these passages, this is what this is the backdrop to what you're seeing here. God appeared to Abraham. And God told Abraham, you're going to have a child. And Abraham was married to Sarah. Now, Sarah was barren. You, you all know what that means, right? Barren. She couldn't have any kids. When she was young, she couldn't have kids. Okay? So it's not like she was old at this time. Is it, or this is something that just developed when she was older. They never had any kids at all. And Abraham's supreme desire was to have a child. He wanted his own kid. And so did Sarah. Which most parents who are struggling to have a kid, that's what they want. They want to have, they are married couples. They want to have a, they want to have a child and become parents. So anyway, that's the backdrop to what's going on here. So God has a relationship with Abraham though. So what does God tell Abraham? I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Now, he didn't say a child. He said many nations. Now, that sounds a little weird to us. You're going to make me the father of many nations? Sarah can't even have one kid, let alone many nations, okay? Now, there's a dual meaning here, but let's just keep it with the one child for now. We'll go from there. So he promised him a child. Well, the issue is Sarah's barren and he's old. The scripture says he's about 100. So what's about 100? Anywhere from 95 to 99, right? That's about 100. All right? And Sarah's womb is dead. Well, Sarah can't be that much far behind him as far as age goes. So he's got a situation here. He's got a word that God has spoken to him, declaring to him that he's going to have a child. But yet, he's got an almost 100-year-old body. Anybody got any family members that are above 90? Not my grandparents. My, my grandpa just passed away. Well, it was about a year. No, not quite a year ago. And he was 91. I cannot imagine him having any kids. Okay? That's hard to picture in your mind. Can you imagine it, if your grandparents, if they're still alive, maybe they are, maybe they're not, or your parents. Huh, I, pr- I bet some, most of them are alive. But your parents come to you and, guess what? You're going to have a brother. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's a weird thought. You'd be like, no, I don't think so. See, Sarah is actually so old, she's already gone through the change of life for women. Okay? And so they're at this point. So now they have this word from God. And they have to make a decision. Am I going to believe God and believe what he said? Or am I going to look at what my age is and what Sarah's age is? Am I going to look at my age, which is 99 or whatever, and look at Sarah, who's never had a kid. Which one is it going to be? Okay, now let's read it again, all right? The scripture says he gives him a promise in verse 17. All right, verse 18. For Abraham, now listen to this in the Amplified, human reason for hope being gone, hoped in faith. Now, let me give you the definition of hope, okay? 
Do you, hope is expectation. That's all it means. Okay. So if I told, if I told you I'm coming to your house on Friday and I'm going to mow your lawn at five o'clock. Now it's, it's Sunday right now. Have I come to your house and, and mowed the lawn yet? No. What do you have for me? A promise. Now, what do you have on your end? You can do one of two things. You can say, yeah, I know that Sean guy. He never shows up. In other words, there's, I've given you a natural uh, 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 character trait of mine to where you don't expect me to come. Or you can say, yeah, I know Sean. He always shows up and does what he says he's going to do. And so you can expect in that. So that's the situation that you have right here. So what is it? What does it say? Abraham, human reason for hope being gone. What does that mean? There's no expectation in from the natural that this is going to happen. But look what it says in the, in the second part. Of the, it says he hoped in faith that he should. What does that mean? That means he didn't expect according to what his body said or Sarah's body but he expected according to what God said. Does that make sense? Now, this is simple. This is so simple. And people go, no, you're confusing me. No, I'm not. Listen, Jesus is the son of God. How many received Jesus before? Okay, I have. All right. So what did you do, though? When, now, I use this illustration all the time, and people find it amusing. But when you said, yeah, I believe in Jesus, did he walk up to you, shake your hand, and step inside you? Did you see him? So where did it come from? Where did that... You heard a promise from God and you expected based on that promise, not based on what you see around you. How do you know you're going to heaven when you die? I know because God promised me I would. I've never been to heaven. Now there are people that have claimed they've been there and I I believe they have because we even have scripture that says that people have gone to heaven and come back. And God's opened heaven up to let them see it. I've never seen heaven. But you know what? I know that I'm going there. Why? Because I have a hope and expectation. There's a faith in my heart based on a promise that God gave me. He said, John, if you believe in me, I'll send you to heaven. As soon as your body, you're done with your body, you throw it off. You're going right to heaven with me. And that's exactly where I'm going. Okay? So I, I have that based on the promise that was given to me. And then my expectation of that promise coming to me. And then it becomes a reality in my life. Now, if you knew me before, I share sometimes, I I do youth camps and different things. I'll preach in different places. But I'll share my testimony about some of the stuff that I used to do. And people look at me like I'm nuts. They're thinking, no way. You? How could you do that? Why? It's a good, I'm glad that they look at me like that. Because what are they saying? Man, God has changed your life so much, you don't even look like you did then. Your life doesn't even resemble what it was then. And I don't want it to be. And I want to be as far away from it as I possibly can. Because I want to look more like Jesus than anybody else. That's my goal. Is to serve and to love him. That's the goal. That's the, that's the motivation. So you see here, God gives Abraham and Sarah a promise. Then, then Abraham has to go, you know what? There's no reason why I could believe this in the natural. But Lord, you said it, so I believe it. And what happened? The Bible says that they received a son named Isaac. Sarah, in her old age, had a son. And his name was Isaac. And you all know what Isaac stands for. Laughter is what Isaac means. Laughter. You'd laugh too if you had a kid at 100. (laughs) You know what I mean? You'd laugh too. You'd have joy in your life too. You say, what are you saying in all this? I'm saying as we move forward in this series... We're going to see promises that God has given us and they'll create laughter in you if you do what Abraham and Sarah did. They'll create joy in your life. Now, listen to me very carefully. I'm not promising you that. God is. I just want to say this. A lot of times, and and I know because I've been around a church most of my life, people get this idea that... And it's a religious mentality that relationship 
It's just been this way for a long time. But relationship with the Lord kind of somehow goes through the minister to God. And really what the Lord is saying is, the ministers I've given to you so that you can have a relationship with God. We're here to facilitate your relationship with him. It's not that we're not here to pray for you, to help you, to counsel if you need counsel, to help you in any way that we can. We're glad to do it because we know that Jesus came to serve and not be served. That's not the issue. The real issue that I'm trying to arrest here in your mind is, is that don't just think in terms of, yeah, you know, God, he's in the church building. Where are you going? We're going to the house of God. You are the house of God according to the Bible. (laughs) Some of you know it, some of you don't. But those are some of the things that we're going to look at. We have this religious mentality that somehow God's trapped inside the, the roof. No, no. The scripture says he comes into your heart. So technically, you brought it with you when you came. Thank you. (laughs) you know what I mean I brought him with me I'm his child I'm his son I'm just a son Jesus is the son he's the man because he did it all he went to the price he paid the price he did it all he redeemed us but listen I'm his son I'm I'm God's son well how do you know that we'll look at it as we continue on in this message the scripture literally says that you are sons and daughters of God you are his child. Well, I don't, you know, the in, in the uh, New Testament, Jesus called some of the religious leaders uh, sons of the devil. I don't want to be that. Not interested. No, thank you. I, I don't want any part of that at all in my life. None. None of it. I don't want any of that. The scripture says in John 10, 10, that Jesus came to give life and life more abundant, but the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I want nothing to do with stealing, killing, and destroying at all. I want everything to do with life and life more abundantly. And so that's what we're presenting today. That's what we're giving to you today. This is an opportunity to go, okay, I came, I heard. Now what am I going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? I'm not asking you to start a church tomorrow. Okay? And neither is the Lord. But let's take one scripture and think about it all week. Just take one. Just take Romans 10, 9, and 10. Say, Lord, you said that if I believe in my my heart and confess with my mouth that you're Lord, then I'd be saved. I believe that. I'm saved. I confess that. So you could take, you say, what do you mean by confess? Very simply this. You could say all week long, just when you think about it. Now, I'm not telling you to just say this all the time. You know, somebody walks up to you and says, hi. You said, I believed in my heart. I confess with my mouth. No, I'm not asking you to do that. Okay. I'm saying to yourself, or if you're driving in your vehicle by yourself or whatever, if you have moments in the day, just get by yourself and say, Lord, you know, I believed that you were the son of God. That means I'm saved. And then just tell him, thanks. Thank you. I'm saved. I don't got to worry about tomorrow because I'm saved. I don't got to worry about the end of my life when I die. Because let me help you with something. The leading cause of death is birth. (laughs) Just think about it. (laughs) Okay? Everybody in this room will die. Everybody. There's nobody. Nobody gets out. They haven't found the fountain of youth. And let me help you. They won't. (laughs) Okay? It is Jesus. But what happens after this life is determined by whether you receive the Lord or not and you believe him. And our prayer for you and goal for you is, hey, receive him. Be a part of what he's doing. Let him invade your life. You know what I mean? That's kind of a negative terminology. But let him become a part of your day-to-day life. I mean, cook meals with Jesus. Do laundry with Jesus. I don't do laundry, but, you know. Mow the lawn with Jesus, all right? I do that, (laughs) okay? Incorporate it into your life. And your life will do what 1 Peter said that we read. You will see happy, many happy days. Many happy days. Amen? And if you haven't received Jesus, I encourage you to do it. If you haven't and you want to, come see me right after the service. 
I'll pray with you. You can receive him. But my point is this. Let him in. You want happy kids? Let the Lord in. My 11-year-old daughter said to me, Kylie, she said to me the other day, I was getting ready to leave and she was memorizing her Bible verse. And they're getting taught the Bible in there. I'll bet you that. But um, she was, she was uh, saying it to me and then she tried to quote another one or something or asked me about one. And so I shared a verse with her that I, she goes, you know all the Bible, you know, 11-year-olds, you know. <laughs> no, sweetie, I don't know all the Bible, okay? But so I left and I went to work because I got to be there early. And she said to me, <laughs> she said, she said, or she said to my wife, you know, mom, I just don't know how people live without the Lord. <laughs> she goes, it's just so great to have the Lord in your life. And that's not just because, you know, she's a preacher's kid. We, I, don't, I don't go around going, you have to believe this. We live it in front of them. Now, I'm not saying perfectly, okay? <laughs> okay? I mean, I could be, our family could be on the reality TV show too, okay? <laughs> we could sell shirts too, okay? <laughs> but what I am saying is, is we've allowed the Lord in. Does that make sense? And so his principles are guiding our life. And so what happens is, it's what you feel right now. Joy. Peace. It's the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity again to come together. Lord, I pray you bless these people. Lord, I know your word is life. Father, I pray for these people that you would open their eyes to see it. We bless them in the name of Jesus and we thank you so much for the opportunity to sow your your uncorruptible word into their lives. Father, I know you're going to reveal yourself to them. Bless them as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. If you would like more information about Faith Family Church, including service times and location, visit faithfamilybillings.com.